Join me tonight on Twitch at 11.30 p.m. Eastern, where we'll talk about everything that happened in week seven of the NFL season. Plus, I'll have my thoughts on the Jaguars game against the Giants. And tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video drops. And now, on with our feature presentation. Earlier this year, I made a video about the 1981 AFC wildcard game over at Chase Stadium between the Buffalo Bills and the New York Jets. If you want to learn more about that game and the incident in question, click the card in the upper right corner. However, to make a long story short, after the Jets won the previous week against the Green Bay Packers to clinch a playoff spot for the first time since the AFL-NFL merger, their fans stormed the field and ended up causing damage to the field and the goalposts, destroying them in the process. The Jets needed to find a replacement set of goalposts and were really struggling to do so, which is kind of important seeing as you can't play a football game without goalposts. Eventually, they were able to put something together in an absolutely bizarre way, using a bunch of different parts from a bunch of different facilities and stadiums and creating a goalpost from a weird mishmash of items. To the naked eye, it might not have seemed any different, but the drama involving the goalpost was incredibly noteworthy, and just like the incredibly close game that it was a part of, was extremely interesting. And what you might not realize is that this was not the last time that we've had goalpost drama in the NFL, where a team was scrambling at the very last minute to figure out what to do. Far from it, in fact. Because nearly a decade and a half later, in 1994, we had an AFC West battle over at Husky Stadium between the Seattle Seahawks and the San Diego Chargers. It's September 18th, 1994. It's week three of the 75th anniversary season, and this divisional battle between the Seahawks and the Chargers might have been the biggest game of the entire week. You had two undefeated teams, with the 2-0 Seahawks and the 2-0 Chargers fighting for first place in the AFC West. You had two of the top offenses in football, with the Seahawks having scored 66 points thus far in the young season, ranking second in the NFL, and the Chargers having scored 64 points, ranking third. You had two teams that looked absolutely convincing, with the Seahawks boasting the best point differential in the NFL at plus 50, and the Chargers boasting the fourth best point differential in the league at plus 20. And you had a pretty even rivalry on paper, with the two teams splitting the season series against each other last year. And yet, despite all of the drama that seemed like was about to take place on the field, for those in the loop, the real drama involved the goalposts. If you were watching this game, they might not have looked any different than regular goalposts. To the untrained eye and to the unaware mind, it might not have felt abnormal or looked even the slightest bit off-putting. But these were no ordinary goalposts. Because much like the ones at Shea Stadium during the playoff game nearly a decade and a half before, the drama involved surrounding the goalposts is a story that deserves a deep dive. This is the story behind one of the strangest field-related controversies in the nearly half-century-long history of the Seattle Seahawks franchise. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question, we need some context to understand how we got to this point, which is the question that many of you probably had initially when seeing the footage. And that is, why the heck are the Seahawks even playing at Husky Stadium in the first place? That's not their usual home venue. That's not their usual house. That's not their beautiful wife. How did they get here? And that's because even though they were supposed to play all of their home games at the Kingdom, just as they had done every year since 1976 when they joined the NFL, even the best laid plans of mice and men go awry. The Seahawks shared the Kingdom, which was a multi-purpose facility, with the Seattle Mariners of Major League Baseball. On July 19, 1994, the Mariners were scheduled to play the Baltimore Orioles. But for the first time in the 18-year history of the Kingdom, the game was called off one hour before first pitch. And that's because prior to the game starting, Four tiles on the roof of the Kingdom fell 180 feet and fell into the stands. As for why the tiles fell, the year before, the Kingdom got a new coating, but they couldn't sandblast the old coating off, so they had to pressure wash it. The pressure washing resulted in some of the acoustic tiles getting waterlogged and ultimately led to them falling from the sky. The good news from all of this was that no one was hurt. This could have been absolutely disastrous, and the fact that no one got hurt or injured in any way from the tiles falling from the kingdom 
is somewhat of a minor miracle. The bad news, however, was that no games could be played until the roof was fixed. This was for rather obvious reasons. You can't exactly play games at a stadium that's falling apart and where your roof is falling from the sky. And this impacted not just the Mariners, who had to play the rest of their season on the road before the strike called off the remainder of the 1994 season, but impacted the Seahawks as well, who had to play their preseason games at nearby Husky Stadium on the campus of the University of Washington. There was hope that the Seahawks would be able to play all of their regular season home games at the Kingdom, and that this wouldn't impact them too much. But after construction delays, highlighted by a week and a half long delay, after two construction workers unfortunately died, that was not going to happen, and they were going to have to find a venue to play their games at for the time being. Eventually, the Seahawks settled on Husky Stadium, which seemed like a logical choice, seeing as its capacity was comparable to that of the Kingdom, and seeing as the stadium was only located six miles away from the Kingdom. So at least from a distance perspective, in theory, it wouldn't be too much of a hassle, although it didn't work that way in actuality, although that's a topic for another video. However, while Husky Stadium seemed like a very logical temporary solution, it still posed some problems. And one of the problems with playing at Husky Stadium came with regards to the goalposts. If you know anything about college football versus pro football, you know that the goalposts are different at both levels. The color of the goalpost is different, as an NFL goalpost is yellow, while a college goalpost is white. And the NFL goalpost is taller than the college goalpost. In 1994, the college goalpost was 30 feet tall, while in the NFL, the goalpost is 40 feet tall. Now in the preseason, this did not matter in the slightest bit. The NFL knew the struggle and the bizarre situation that the Seahawks found themselves in, and preseason games don't really matter from a scoring perspective. So the NFL allowed the Seahawks in Husky Stadium to keep the goalposts as they were, with no alterations or modifications. But for the regular season, the NFL made it abundantly clear that the Seahawks would have to figure something out. They couldn't play at Husky Stadium with the current goalpost setup, and they would need to have NFL regulation goalposts. So you might be saying to yourself that this shouldn't be a problem whatsoever, right? There are goalposts in the Kingdom in storage that are NFL regulation. So just bring those goalposts over to Husky Stadium and swap them out with the college goalposts. And if that was what the Seahawks wound up doing, let's be honest, this wouldn't even be a video. This would be a complete non-story, as there's nothing even the slightest bit unique about that. Because the Seahawks physically could not do that. Number one, there wasn't a whole lot of leeway that Washington gave the Seahawks as part of this temporary agreement to play at Husky Stadium. It was not exactly the friendliest of agreements, and the Seahawks, as the visitors, were treated like the visitors completely at the mercy of the University of Washington. All of the signage from Washington was left up. The times of the games were completely dependent on whatever was taking place on campus. One of their home games later on against the Pittsburgh Steelers had to be moved from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock due to freshman orientation. The end zones weren't repainted, nor was the 75th anniversary logo put on the field, making it the only stadium in the NFL without the logo. They couldn't even sell beer at the games, not even in a beer garden situation like Sun Devil Stadium tried doing a few years before with the Cardinals, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. In other words, Washington was making it very clear to the Seahawks that you should be grateful that we're even letting you use our venue on relatively short notice with all the chaos that usually takes place on campus as is. You're not messing with our field. But number two, even if Washington was a gracious host, and even if they had no problem letting the Seahawks run wild, it would be just about impossible for the goalposts to be swapped out, even on short notice. And that's because the goalposts were, for all intents and purposes, indestructible. And to talk about why that was the case, we have to go back a few years to November 18, 1989, when the Washington Huskies hosted the Washington State Cougars in the Apple Cup one of the best in-state rivalries in all college football. It was a great win for Washington, as they defeated their in-state rival by a final score of 20-9, never trailing at any point and looking in complete control from the onset, scoring a defensive touchdown on the very first play from scrimmage. But when people talk about the 1989 Apple Cup more than 30 years later, 
They don't talk about it for what happened during the game, and they don't talk about it for the on-field action. Rather, they talk about it for what happened after the game, when happy Washington fans, excited after winning the game, especially following last year's heartbreaking one-point loss to the Cougars, rushed the field and tried to tear down the goalposts. And unlike the Tennessee-Alabama game from last week, this goalpost teardown story doesn't exactly have a happy ending. For more than 30 minutes, fans tried to not just tear down the goalposts, but fight off police officers while doing so. Three people got arrested and cited for criminal trespass. Police officers were hitting students trying to tear down the goalposts with nightsticks. One fan was injured when the post came down, and the post injured them. Another fan who tried climbing the goalpost was sprayed with mace, and got injured so badly that he had to be taken to Washington's locker room to receive immediate treatment. Another fan was in medical care for four hours. University Police Chief Mike Shanahan, no relation to the NFL head coach, called it a public safety issue, and said that it was the most dangerous situation he'd ever seen after a game in his 19 years with the school. Combine that with ice being thrown by students and officers, and an article in the student newspaper leading up to the game, advocating for the fans to storm the field and tear down the goalposts if they won, and it was just a giant mess that, for obvious reasons, Washington wanted to ensure would never happen again, from a monetary standpoint, a safety standpoint, and a litigation standpoint. And because of this, when the new goalpost was put in to replace the old one that was torn down, this one was put in with a 12-foot deep anchor in the ground. In other words, it could not be removed. It was indestructible. So merely swapping out the goalposts from one that are college regulation to those that are NFL regulation was not possible. Okay, so if you couldn't swap them, why not just paint them from white to yellow? Well, you couldn't do that either. Number one, you'd have to keep painting them from white to yellow every time. And if you do that too many times, it might ruin the goalpost. Number two, it might work for this scam against the Chargers, since Washington is on by that week. But later in the season, the Seahawks and Huskies were playing games on the same weekend at home. And this meant that the paint likely wouldn't be able to dry in time. You need a solution that works for every week, not just some weeks. On top of that, even if you could paint it, that's a lot of time and manual labor to paint that much space in that short of a period of time. And that means less time and labor that you have for other aspects of the changeover from the Huskies to the Seahawks. Plus, remember that on top of just changing the color of the goalpost, you had to extend the height of the goalpost by 10 feet, complicating matters even further. So what did the Seahawks do to address this rather bizarre problem? Seeing as they couldn't leave the goalposts as they were, seeing as they couldn't replace the goalposts, and seeing as they couldn't just paint over the goalposts. That's where they got creative. Because the Seahawks just decided to get a whole bunch of fluorescent yellow cloth and cover up the goalposts that way, and then add the sleeve-like extensions with the yellow fabric covering it up. It's an incredibly innovative and creative way to fix the problem. Just wrap the whole thing up in cloth and cover up the white in that way. And the NFL allowed the Seahawks and Husky Stadium to do this, even though, obviously, a ball going off of cloth off the goalposts is going to bounce differently than a ball going off the steel. For the NFL, as long as it was yellow and was regulation height, it was permissible. It was a complete last minute, makeshift solution to a bizarre problem, but it was good enough for the NFL and got the job done. The Seahawks were scrambling and it ended up working out for them. And for what it's worth, the Chargers won this game 24 to 10. Although today, the game is likely not remembered for the goalpost drama. Because if you remember this game, it's likely for this play in the third quarter, when Chargers quarterback Stan Humphreys threw a 99-yard touchdown pass to Tony Martin, tying the NFL record for the longest play from scrimmage, and a record that will never be broken. It was just the 7th 99-yard passing touchdown in NFL history, and the 8th 99-yard touchdown at the time. And it came while backed up and while standing next to a goalpost covered in yellow cloth. Playing in temporary venues usually poses some kind of challenge, no matter how trivial or ridiculous it may seem. And on this day in 1994, with the Seahawks opening up their home slate against the Chargers, we saw just that in action. 
it wasn't perfect by any means. Heck, if you look closely, you can see some parts of the goalposts that are white. You can see that it's multicolored. If you haven't seen it, look at the bottom center of the goalpost, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. The cloth didn't go all the way around, but it got the job done which, considering the unique set of circumstances, is all you can ask for. Because on this September day in 1994, the Seahawks did everything in their power to make the goalposts work, without moving the goalposts. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.